cute sun visor. Again and welcome to this live broadcast in honor of Oliver Reginald Tambo. He was born on this day in 1917 in the Eastern Cape. One of ten children, and uh, his father had four wives. Quite a traditionalist, but a firm believer in Western education, and that's why we saw Oliver Tambo go on to study maths and physics in Fort Hare. He then went on to also study law. But we want to get now a bit of a personal perspective on the man, and we join. Joined now by Dali Tambo, one of his uh, children, to talk to us about the man behind the movement. A very good morning to you. Good Always morning. a pleasure. Good morning. Thank you so much. I believe uh, Oliver Tambo was uh, quite a lover of music. Uh, he adored music. In those days, you used cassette players. And he had his two essential items for travel. One was a radio so that he could listen to BBC World Service and all the international uh, channels on the political side. And then he had this tape recorder and a number of tapes which went from African choral music, freedom music, to uh, things like Handel's Messiah and things. So when he had a birthday, I always knew buy him classical or buy him choral. And that was his... Um, downtime. He would listen to classical music, to choral music, um, to uh, all kinds of music. He loved music. He was a choral con uh, conductor and uh, trained choirs and he even wrote a couple of pieces which are still performed today. Um, even at the Melting Pot I believe they'll be doing one of his uh, choral pieces um, as they've done in the past. So yeah, he loved music. Just researching a bit about his life and times, I found out that in high school he was nominated to be the head boy in essence and he, he said rather somebody else should do that and he will be deputy. That says to me that he was quite a servant leader, that he was always about the people and not just about position. Was he selfless like that all the time? Always. I mean a very humble man. Um, almost to a fault, you know. Um, you couldn't praise him without him deflecting the praise to other people. And with good reason, it was a collective out there. And if he hadn't had the Moses Kotanis and uh, um, Mac Maharajas and Tabo and Beckys and all kinds of people, um, Alfred and Zoes, all of those people around him, um, it would have been an impossible task. So it was a collective thing, but obviously he led it. I remember one time him saying to my mother how it was a particularly difficult time and he said how he missed Walter Sisulu and uh, Nelson um, you know and spoke about the different attributes that they would have brought to that situation I remember specifically him saying you know I miss Nelson because in this situation he probably would have gone he was a bull he probably would have <laughs> just charged and uh, you know dad was more analytical examined the situation from all sides etc so you know it, it, it was a tough ask um, his job to uh, go out there and uh, um, bring the international solidarity and progress the struggle inside the country and outside but I think part of the reason why he was able to do that is his values his um, total purity. Mm. I remember one of his bodyguards telling me that uh, when they'd been on an international trip he had been given a suitcase full of money for the struggle he went to the office in Lusaka and he had these coins and they said, no, Mr. President, you don't have to give us that. He said, no, no. And he counted every cent, minus the coffee and sandwiches they'd had, um, counted every cent. Aww. And um, so, you know, he was that kind of man. He wanted to signal always that it's not about us, it's about the mm. people at home. Mm. Um, but as a father, um, he was absent, obviously, yeah. <laughs> most of the time. Mm. Um, That's exactly what I wanted to ask because he went on to study law. He, as you mentioned, was quite instrumental in galvanizing support for the ANC outside the country, welcoming MK soldiers and the like. He also was the longest serving president of the ANC. This says to me, a remarkable man politically, but an absent dad. So how did that affect your relationship? Well, you know, I adored him and uh, I got unconditional love from him. Um, but it wasn't like we saw each other a lot. Mm. So on the occasions he would come, which would be twice a year or something, it wouldn't just be him walking through the door, it would be him and 16 other people. And then uh, within an hour, Joe Slovo would arrive, and then uh, the Pahad brothers, and then this one and that one. And um, so I remember one time my mother actually saying to him, take your son down to the park, you've got a break, and teach him football. And he said, no, Dilly, I don't have time. She said, every father teaches their son how to kick a ball. Oh. So he did. He took me down 
but because he was a perfectionist, I never really enjoyed it, you know, <laughs> because he would insist on precision in how you kick that ball and all of this kind yeah. of stuff. Real perfectionist, but no, a glorious father. And I've always considered myself the luckiest person in the world to have had a father and a mother um, uh, like the ones I had. Uh, they, they were total in their commitment, both to the struggle, but also to the family. And um, no, I couldn't have wished for anything else when I look back on it. And of course, Mama Adelaide Tambo holding down the fort through it all as a nurse, also practicing, working 12 to 20 hour days sometimes to provide for the family. So she deserves to be celebrated today and we'll bring you up to speed with those celebrations. We know President Jacob Zuma will be laying the wreaths here in honor of Odada or Oliver Numama or Adelaide Tambo. More in just a moment. Stay with us.